Hey there, Dango Stu here. Today's video is about repairing the rust in a steel boat and is proudly sponsored by MarineEngine.com. This video goes through a full spectrum of techniques that may be of use to you. Starts with a simple application of rust converter and goes through to cutting the entire back deck out. All right, let's get started. I'm not a border maker, I'm not a professional welder. There's plenty of great channels that uh, will take you all through those welding techniques. Um, Jody from uh, WeldingTricksAndTips.com, highly recommended. Uh, Damien here has Project Brewpeg, which is uh, another YouTube channel, link in the description. He's got a video where this patch on the side of his boat, he cut that right out because it was thin. New ribs, new everything, so I'll put a link to that too. Lots of good information in there. This is the rust converter I'm going to use, lots of different ones, Galmet, there's just one from Bunnings, but they generally contain some sort of uh, tannic acid to do the conversion, and then some sort of polymer to kind of help seal it. I'm going to brush all the loose rust off here, and this old paint on top as well. I don't want to brush this back to shiny metal though, because the idea is that this converter converts these uh, ferric oxide into ferric tannates. Ferric tannates are much more stable, adhere well to the steel. Often, if you can't sandblast steel, you're actually better off letting it rust, have the mill scale come off, let the rust do a small amount of pitting, brush it, do a rust converter and painting. It'll actually stick better than if you paint onto new steel. Nothing loose is left on now, but I'm not going crazy because if there's any sort of primer or something that's not coming off, well, great. If it doesn't come off with a grinder, it's not going to come off at its own. And we've still got this slightly rusty steel to convert into the ferric tannate, which is a really nice material to bond the primer onto when we paint. We need enough of this stuff to convert all the rust, but we don't want excess. We have to wash the excess off. It's a bit like putting hardener in uh, epoxy or something. Not enough and you've got leftover resin, too much you've got leftover hardener. Same thing, we don't want leftover rust and we don't want leftover converter. So just cover it, see how it goes, clean it before painting. So this isn't just a paint, it's a converter. Slowly you'll see this change to like a real sort of black bluish colour, which is the ferric tannate from the oxide that was the reddish rust colour. I've sped this film up to eight times, which really isn't that fast, so you can see how quickly it does react. But I would leave it a good 24 hours before deciding whether you need to add more or whether all the rust is converted. Sandblasting is a bit of your gold stand to get rid of this sort of surface rust, but for average guys like you and I, this is a pretty good alternative. You can see here there's still a little bit of rust colour that can be seen, so we need to put a bit more rust converter on. I'm going to give it a light brush first, and then we'll put a second coat on. After that, there should be enough to get on and do some priming. We'll let that sit for another 24 hours and they should be good to go after that. Thanks to Adam's help yesterday, we now have this bulwark cut out. Uh, I've cut it reasonably high because the bottom section is quite rusty anyway. So I am going to replace that before we reinstall it. But the main reason for cutting it out was that a lot of the rust you can see here it's really thin where the water's been sitting. So I need to cut right back here to replace this. It would have been really hard to work in all these corners. So get rid of it, get good access, replace the deck, replace the bottom inch or so of the bulwark, weld it back on. Next job, uh, Damien and I are gonna get the needle gun out. There's no point needle gunning a lot of it because clearly it just has to go. But I do want to investigate just some of the corners and try and find the limits of where we're going to replace with a large, you know, large sheet of steel and where we're going to be doing smaller patches. For example, places up here, I might do a patch, whereas here will be pretty much a new sheet of steel. 
you know, where I've got all this sicker flex just covering holes, no point taking that off again, just cut it out. A little bit tricky in that the hull is sort of here. This is a sponson that sticks out. There's a steel sponson and then the timber one bolted on. So the hull is about here where the bulwark goes down. So I think what I'll do is I'll cut back a little bit, which will let me see into what I'm actually dealing with rather than cutting blind. It's also worth mentioning, I was a pretty big fan of this uh, T-Rex waterproof tape when I started putting it on the deck like this. And I'm even more of a fan. Now I'm trying to take it off. If you had to do an emergency patch on a wet, rusty deck with zero surface preparation, I just don't see how you could beat this tape. It's amazing. I can't even get that off. Not that I need to, I'm cutting it out, but it's incredible stuff. Plenty of rust can look superficial, but once you get in there like a chisel bit on a jackhammer like Damien's using, or a needle gun like I use in a second, you start to realise that these little bits of surface rust can go much deeper than you think. So make sure you don't be optimistic, just go and find the truth, get stuck right in there and get all the way down to good metal, that way you know what you're up against. Next level of rust is pitting like this. And to fix this, we're gonna have a go at pad welding it, which is simply just filling it well to build it up. Then you can grind it smooth again if you want, or not. Where I had a lot of these and holes all the way through is where I've cut the deck out. We'll be getting to this as sort of stage whatever. This is sort of the uh, extreme end of the scale opposite the uh, rust converter. But these are the techniques along the way, depending on the situation you're facing. This, I'm going to have a go at pad welding. So, just going to grind all the paint and the rust away so we get to a good metal, like a shiny metal this time, because we're not using rust converter. And then we'll run a couple of beads along here and see if we can build this up without blowing through the metal where it's too thin. If you blow through or the rust is already gone all the way through, you can also use a copper backing strap, which I'll show you after this. So you can see the idea essentially, take a depression that's not all the way through, build it up with a relatively cold weld, and then you can kind of blend it into the old steel. It's not structural, it's just a much better alternative to an epoxy putty. Another one here just outside our cut zone, may as well pad weld that too. I find it best to start where there's good steel and come across it, otherwise you'll undercut, you'll get slag and trap and all that kind of thing, so move right across the divot. All right, let that cool for a bit, we'll chip that slag off, but also worth noting with this one here, obviously you're gonna burn all your paint off underneath, but that's okay, because we've got heaps of painting to do under here anyway when we put the new plates in. So better off doing it now, before you paint, otherwise there'll be tears before bedtime. So chip that one big splooge of metal, but high enough that we can grind it smooth, paint, high build primer, a couple of coats, sand, paint, whatever you need to get it to look good. That wire wheel's not super aggressive. Here's a bit of rust, and you can see there's rust still in it. Nothing beats the chipping hammer or a strong needle gun for getting it out.
given this is four mil steel I can guarantee you that's you know sub millimeter thick I'm finding with the pad welding what's working best a couple of holes here quite close to each other is about 110 amps for the 3.2 millimeter rod steel started at four mil thick is really just doing a weave rather than doing parallel runs seems to be working better so I'm going to do a weave across here and then we'll uh, chip it off and see what it looks like all right I definitely think the uh, extra 10 amps is helping keep the weld flatter so less grinding to do obviously and weaving is also keeping it flatter and less slag entrapment than doing multiple parallel runs so with my extensive research of about 20 minutes I would say 110 amps 3.2 millimeter rod 4 mil steel starting thickness and a weave seems to be working best Mate, can you keep it down there? I'm trying to film a YouTube channel here. Fuck you, I'll start playing some copyright music. <laughs> like the police do. Before we put this plate in position, let's just look at a couple of other techniques for fixing holes like this that are just outside the area we cut. This technique involves getting a relatively thick copper backing strap and clamping it in position before doing the pad welding. All right, let's say we take the copper out now, get the clamps out of the way, give it a grind, see where we are. Let's see what the copper looks like. So, hot, but obviously not welded to the steel because it's not possible. So it worked pretty well. We reckon that it's about six millimeters thick. It's conducted quite a bit of heat away too, which is good when you're trying to pad weld. When I put this plate in, we'll be welding along here, at which point I'll fill this up a bit more, but the copper backing worked really well for pad welding a section where the hole is right through as opposed to just being a thin section. Probably the most common repair I've done are just patches and by a patch I mean a bit of metal that doesn't span two ribs, it's in between two ribs. You can simply cut out the metal and put a new bit of steel in. Okay, put out standard patch grinder disc on. I've done quite a few of these on this boat. Uh, you know, it's one there one up in the ceiling there, they're all over the place. Mostly I do them as, as circles because it's a little bit easier. Some of them are sort of squares with rounded corners. I haven't filmed one for this video though, so I'm gonna sheet a bit and grab some video from a couple of weeks ago. So apologies to subscribers who have seen this little bit of footage before, but it's a really important technique in that it's probably your go-to in some respects for a hole that is too big to pad weld, but not so big that it spans multiple ribs. I'm going to fix the hole where I cut the paddle wheel log out, uh, but Damien's got a really good tip for cleaning up the plasma cut hole before I do, which is... <laughs> when you've got like a round hole-ish like this, you've sort of freehanded it with the plasma, you've got basically something that you need to like get a piece of steel up there and make the patch to go over. The more uniform you can make this edge, the easier it is to do the patch. So the trick that I use is just getting a, a six mil grinding disc, just a, a new one, so you get a nice flat edge on the side, and then you grind by literally holding it as you're going around like, like, like so. You just grind it around and around and around like that, 
um, and you end up flattening off all of the burrs and all the rubbish that you get from the plasma cutter. Um, it doesn't take long to actually get it to work, but you end up with a way, way better job. Some people are really worried about doing it without a guard, um, and the easiest way to deal with that is to give it to a friend and just get them to do it. <laughs> The steel I used to make this patch had been pre-sandblasted and primed to make doing the inside a bit easier. An arrow towards the keel. All right, thanks. Here's the patch cut out. Now I'm going to grind the slag off the back and bevel it a little bit so we get better penetration on the double continuous weld both sides. the inside now and on Damien's advice I'm going to get in with a like an older grinding disc that's got more of a point to it and just V it out a little bit before welding the outside. The next repair I'm going to do is using a patch that goes over the steel, which is commonly called a doubler. Not a big fan of this, but uh, you know, sometimes it has its uses. I saw a restoration of a car carrier, a big ship, a while ago on YouTube, and uh, I think they did the whole job in a month or something, and they totally resurfaced the car deck, and ripping it out would have been a huge job, so they just laid more steel on top. I definitely think it has its place. I'm just you know, I'm not a big fan, but I'd say just use it wisely and wear appropriately. In this case, I, ages ago, right at the beginning of this project, somewhere if I can find it, had a whole lot of little discs laser cut. The idea was that I had a hole saw that matched. Wherever there was a bit of a, you know, a little hole like this, I could put a hole saw through it and have a whole set of these identical matching little discs that were four mil thick, same as the hole. In this case, I'm simply going to weld it on top because this hole is within the wheelhouse. So there's the timber ceiling and everything below this. You can see there's a little bit of insulation here, so I'm not super worried. Ideally, you have someone below on Firewatch. But in this case, I'm going to get a smallish rod, reasonably low heat, and I'm just going to weld it on as a doubler and paint over it. It'll block the hole and we've got much less chance of setting fire to the timber inside by trying to fill this gap or anything. Well, there it is, splitched on, a bit too cold, then a bit too hot as you can see from the splatter. But it's on, it's not going anywhere, and we didn't set fire to the cabin, so I'm going to call that a win. The day is getting on, and indeed the week is getting on, so I've got to get this video out. But I wanted to show you one other technique, which is simply cleaning, priming, and bogging a depression. I'm running out of time to do this, but one area I am going to do it, for now, is... where are we? Essentially, this is above the fuel tank. I could empty the fuel tank, uh, pump it with CO2, open the inspection hatch, let air through, whatever. Don't have time to do that, unfortunately. So, what I'm going to do is clean this up, put a bit of primer on, put a bit of epoxy bog in, and then we're going to paint. I am, however, going to keep a very good record of where it is, because I want to know for next time, if ever the tanks are emptied, cleaned out, I can get in and fix this properly. But in the spirit of showing all the possible techniques, this is one way to go. This, I would say, is about one and a half millimeters through the four millimeters, so I'm not worried about it. Really what we're doing is preventing any further deterioration and making it look nice by bogging it. You're stopping it from collecting water and being an obvious eyesore. So let's really quickly show this. Ideally, I would get the wet blaster out and blast it first. I'm just going to use the wire wheel though because uh, this video is due out very soon and I do not have time, but just squint and imagine. Imagine it's a uh, sandblaster cleaning it. All right, here's my imaginary sandblaster. <laughs> 
after I cleaned the hole out and got the rust out with the wire wheel, I then gave it a wipe with some acetone and then brushed some primer onto it. In this case, obviously, it's a bit of a cheap and nasty primer, but when I do the whole deck, I'll use an epoxy. Continuing our exercise in imagination, imagine this is a wonderful two-pack epoxy primer instead of a one-pack paint I got from Bunnings, and imagine it's dry, which it's not. Now what we're going to do is put a two-pack epoxy filler into here, you have to imagine that as well because this is just a cheap wood filler, but it gives you the idea. All right, so we've got primer, filler, now we can do a couple of undercoats, a couple of top coats, and it'll be fine. Like doublers, I'd call this close to my last resort technique, but being the you know the top of a fuel tank i'm not going to pad weld it until you know the tank's empty and safe so this will do for now the last tip i'll give before we go on to the full deck repair is be a bit strategic and clever about uh, fixing holes for example there's a hole in the deck and a bit of pitting here on this uh, starboard side but I need to put a flush water fitting in, so why not put it where the hole is? Doesn't matter where it goes, so there's the perfect place. I simultaneously install my water fitting and fix a hole at the same time. This old emergency tiller socket was mild steel, the threads were corroded, there was a lot of pitting around it. So I went and bought a stainless one that was half an inch, maybe more, bigger than the old one, cut it out, put the new one in, fixes all the damage and gives me a new socket. So really the essence is just have a think about what you've got to do and how you can be clever about it and solve a problem, install a fitting and fix a hole at the same time. It's kind of just the, the lazy man in me saying, you know, can we make life a little bit easier? One other thing worth mentioning with regards to stainless parts like this is that Damien's saying in the yard here, whenever he sees a trawler come in, he talks to the guys, if it's got rust, they'll cut the rust out and they'll almost always replace it with stainless because it's rusted for a reason. It's an area that gets heavy abrasion, the paint chips off. So if it's happened once, it'll happen again, cut it out, replace it with stainless. I think that's good advice. Not so much an issue for me because the boat's no longer a working fishing boat, but you know, I think it is a thing worth considering at each time. It's not a problem putting stainless and mild together above the water line. I mean, the bowsprit here, I'll show you. This is mild steel, this is stainless, and it was welded on 30 years ago. You know, there's no issue with galvanic corrosion without an electrolyte present. Just make sure you paint the mild steel well. I'm going to cut just a little section of deck off here with the angle grinder so we can have a look how the sponson's constructed. The hull comes up about here, about where the sponson is. Then we've got this metal sponson and the timber sponson. So I'm gonna have a look here how I can get in, how we can weld a new plate. You know, what's the best idea really? Hard to, hard to know without looking more clearly at what's going on underneath. Having a bit of change of plan. Because I can see exactly this point here that I don't want to cut below from the inside, makes perfect sense just to plasma cut from the inside out, jump up, see how it's going. If that works well, we'll just follow that line. We can follow every rib. And then once we've got just the tops on the ribs, we can sort of unpick those from above. I think this is gonna be the best way. Let's give it a shot. Damien eventually convinced me that trying to pick the deck off the ribs is a bit of a fool's errand. It takes a lot of time, you damage them. It's heaps easier, quicker and cheaper just to cut the ribs out and put new ones in and put a new deck on. And I've got to say, having tried it, I agree 100%. Time to change the plasma cutter consumables. See the tip there. That's what the new one looks like there. So we'll swap that out. Brand new spray can of Deck Be Gone.
once the deck was cut off with the plasma cutter, the next job was to neaten up the ends of the longitudinals so that I could make a nice scarf joint to weld the new longitudinal in to take the new ribs. Okay, have our scarf joints cut out, all the ends 45 Now we need to sandblast this before we put it in. Sandblasting the steel is very important to get the profile you need for the primer to stick. If you paint straight onto mill scale, you can pretty much guarantee the coating will fail within weeks to months tops. In this case I'm using Damien's wet blaster setup. I'll put a link in the description to his video on setting that up. So this is as uh, open as it's going to be. Going back together from now on. Damien's here going to give me a hand. We'll just uh, get this longitudinal tacked in and then I can sort of fiddle doing the ribs tomorrow. Alrighty. Yeah, good here. Going to weld it out quickly before the sun sets. Got the long and tunnel in last night and tonight, a little bit earlier, we're going to start tacking in our first few ribs. So let's get those happening. The old ribs were angle line on this side, the new ribs are flat bar on this side. Keeps it nice and simple. I thought I was all set to go, then I realised I left my beer downstairs. Got this end of the rib cut to the angle, five degree slope on the deck so that's cut to 85 degrees this rib has to come under the deck here with a little gap to weld we don't want it hard against the steel Let's finish these ribs off. I was uh, very confident I was going to finish them yesterday afternoon and then I uh, fell victim to the Heineken uncertainty principle. Before getting ready to weld the decking plates on, I laid some new fire blankets underneath to catch all the hot slag, etc. from the welding process. I laid this ply on top and just traced around the lazarette hatch so we can fit it in. Now I'll get underneath and we will trace around the deck here as well. This plywood isn't as wide as the steel so that's no big deal, we'll just sort of extrapolate a little bit. It's worth noting that another good way to do templates is to get some thin pieces of flat bar. If there's no curves you can lay them out to make the perimeter, tack weld them in place and that becomes your template. People can also use ticking sticks for areas that are sort of awkward to get into, lots of different techniques, but in this case I found just the sheet of thin plywood to be the easiest. They're my will, so don't get under it. <laughs> Thank you. 
we've got pretty good fitment in most places a few little areas along here where I might just take a tiny bit off the template wasn't as wide as the sheet of steel uh, but the sheet of steel was uh, a bit wider than I thought to be honest with you so what I'm going to do is just run a one mil cutting disc down here that'll give us a one mil gap to weld and it'll just drop in so get that one mil disc and we'll cut all the places where it's overhanging just a tiny bit I can now run a one mil disc all the way through there so there's a tiny gap in fact I can do it everywhere so we're ready to start welding this to the ribs in stitch sections we're not doing continuous welds on the ribs just a small section here we are below deck what we're going to do now is do some stitch welding of the plates onto the longitudinal and the rib we're going to start in the middle and work our way out a bit like sort of tensioning a cylinder head you don't want to start at the edges find out you've got a bubble and you can't push it down much better off taking it getting it flat and working your way out like you're maybe working air out from under a big sticker or something like that all right let's go get one of the uh 7016 rods out of the oven and start uh doing some uh, welding we're stitch welding which is you know a bit of a weld gap weld gap to the ribs but we're continuous double continuous welding the plates to each other so water doesn't get in I'm going to lift this plate up a little bit and then just tack it for now but below I'm going to put a pry bar here and just use that to lift it up while I do the tack on the ribs, lift it up. So that's flush, probably got to do a bit more here. It doesn't look too bad along there. Here's fine as well, this is where the old ridge weld was, so I think we're pretty safe. I think we're kind of home and hose with this one, we're doing all right been lucky sometimes decks can be all over the shop and it can get really hard but I think we've been lucky this time all right memory cards full and I'm empty let's push on tomorrow cut the second plate now not quite the same fitment I had on the first one kind of with geniuses but definitely enough to do a bit of a stitch weld and build it up and then by the time we do a double continuous weld watertight no video on replacing deck plates though would be complete without a discussion on dogs, wedges and levers. Dogs think dog clutch, just something that something wedges against. So for example, before I stitch this to the ribs, I actually want to get it level on these plates. I don't want it lifted right up off the ribs, but at the same time, I don't want to stitch it to a rib here and realize that I have to really bend it up. So it's a bit of a, you know, dance to the music, play, uh, play the game of trying to halve your error everywhere to get the best result you can what I need to do is lift this up so what I'm going to do is weld this dog here then I can either use a pry bar to lift it up or I can have a, a wedge under here so let's weld this on first then I'll show you what I mean the trick with dogs like this is only weld one side because then you can knock it off you can lever it away and break the weld don't weld both sides otherwise you have to grind it off get in here now easily and lift this plate up or you can see here how much force the wedge gives you you know I can just tap it by hand and lift this plate up it's only four mil steel but if I was hitting this wedge with a sledgehammer at this end you can see I could actually deform six eight mil steel and get it to where i want it to be that's actually come up a little bit too high i really only need about there so i'm going to tack here normally i wouldn't start with this top weld but it's a good way just to make sure the plate's in pretty good shape before i jump below and start stitching it to the ribs and welding the underside oh it's worth saying also before we do this sort of stuff i just have one tack one stitch on a rib in the center you can see from the heat there Ooh still hot uh, just to make sure that we don't have the whole sheet floating right off the ribs by the time we get it square to the deck shouldn't happen obviously but better safe than sorry
there's no real problem grinding with a cutting disc because you know everyone's got to die of something all right now that looks like it can pop down when i hammered it it's sort of stuck let's have a look we'll tap it it's bouncing now all right once again dogs wedges push it down tack it before i resort to welding the dog on let's just try a bit of weight see if that does it or not this is the weight i use for marking dive locations doesn't look like it's quite enough to get it down though with the lead here and putting a bit of my own weight on it through this pry bar i can get it down i'm just going to hold it and tack it rather than using the dog and wedge this time where i want to join these two plates the sponsor here this one's low this one's high so it's worth putting the dog on here the wedge here because you kind of getting them to do this which should bring them both into an equilibrium tack it out and we'll be good to go you can hopefully see there it's brought them level with each other but we brought this one down a bit this one up a little bit tack that and then we're in good shape What I might do is look for a few places where they are level, tack those while they're level, make hay while the sun shines, so to speak, and then work on the rest. The other reason we do lots of tacks around is that heat makes plate metal like this really distort. So if you just start welding a lot in one point, you're gonna warp it. You need to kind of work around and manage that situation. It's one of the hardest things about welding really is managing heat and the way it deformed metal. The deck was actually going pretty smoothly and wasn't too hard. I was actually pleasantly surprised how easy it was to replace it. I would definitely recommend doing that. Taking a break though gave me the chance to ponder some of the advantages of stick welding over MIG welding that I'd been discussing with Damien. We both uh, have our preferences. I think both are quite good techniques, but uh, I'm just much more used to stick welding. He's much more used to uh, MIG welding. I think for the big long runs that decking does, MIG's great, but uh, yeah, it's just something I've really got to spend more time practicing, I think. All right, long afternoon, sun setting. Got uh, all the stitching below was trying to do some of the welding, uh, you know, the welding from underneath first, but because the fitment was a bit poor, I actually found it easier to fill it all in from the top. Then I can go in, just stick a rod up there and blast along the bottom of everything. But that's happening tomorrow. The joy of grinding and welding the underside has begun. It's so windy today, the whole boat's shaking, which is kind of good because the wind's blowing across the lazarette hatch and sort of acting like a venturian, sucking the smoke out, which is good. Okay, welded the entire underside now, so we're going to double continuous across the whole deck. Now I am going to duck below with the famed needle gun, get off burnt paint and also just chip all the slag off with it nice and easy why not use it well thanks for watching uh it's been a really busy week so i hope this kind of came across okay i've been trying to show each technique at the same time as actually get this boat fixed so been a bit of a juggling act uh obviously there's a lot more tricks and techniques that can be used so feel free to share those in the comments uh but um i hope it helps you if you do own a steel boat and you're looking at trying to fix it up I think the one main piece of advice I could give, and this is the piece of advice that Damien gave me having seen so many boats fixed in the yard, is don't be afraid to cut stuff out. Steel isn't timber. You can cut a bit of steel out, put a new bit in, weld it in. The survey specification says don't have a weld within 100 millimeters of another weld. So as long as you adhere to that, it's pretty much as strong as it ever was. So there's nothing to really fear when it comes to cutting chunks of your boat out and just putting new steel in. My initial tendency when I started, much to the frustration of some more experienced people when I was working on this boat, was to 
sort of fiddle around the edges. People just go, look, that's all bad, just get rid of it, put new in. And not only is it easier, it's faster, it's cheaper, you know, it's a mental block, but once you get past that, it's definitely the way to go with steel boats. But I think the other techniques are appropriate when the corrosion is mild. So, you know, just pick the technique that suits your situation. All right, we'll take care, I'll catch you soon. See ya. Residents of Bundaberg were alarmed to see a man being chased down the main street by another man wielding a machete. The man being chased was described by a bystander as having dropped a bag of empty cans of spray paint, all coloured alpine green. The man with the machete was described as a foreign national and very angry looking. Both men have now been arrested by police for further questioning.